And welcome to this week's Free Advice Friday. I'm so glad to see you all. I am uh, working here from my office. I've got a new office, as some of you may notice. It's wonderful to that you guys join me every week. I really appreciate it. I see that Jay, hey, how you doing? Is on the chat. Also wanted to mention that we do have a Q&A box. For those of you who are joining me for the first time, and I see there's a lot, a lot of you on the line already, please go either, if you're watching me on Facebook Live, right to the chat box below the Free Advice Friday, the video that you see on Facebook. And if you're joining me live on the webinar, I want to remind you guys that you guys get precedence. I always make sure I answer the questions for the people who have joined me on the actual webinar. For those of you who are curious how to join me on the webinar, please go to amysadvice.com. amysadvice.com will take you right to my webinar page where you can click on the big red button and it'll show you how to sign up to join us free every Friday. Oh, it's so good to see you all. Welcome, Denise, and welcome everyone who's here. Let me, uh, let's see who else is on the line today. We've got, uh, let's see, we've got Jay and Denise, Alexander, um, uh, Sandy, sorry, and uh, Ellie, good to see you, Janice. Uh, oh, Jean Covert, how are you? Jean Daly, a lot of Jays today. Kate, Linda, oh, Linda from California, Ray from Germany, it's good to see you. Sonia, Sue, Wendy, we got a lot of old hands and a couple of new people today. So let's go right into the questions. I do want to remind you guys that Free Advice Friday, amysadvice.com, amysadvice.com is, uh, is where to go if you'd like to leave me questions for next week, if you'd like to join me live here every week. Sue, go ahead, answer the, ask the questions right in the Q&A box. The, I, I will try and keep the chat open as well. I'm also looking at what's going on on Facebook. I'm trying to, to keep it all going and see how, I can, um, see how I can answer all of your questions. So to start, Denise has asked, if I can remind her what size for novels are preferred for font and font sizing for Ingram Spark. Um, I think you mean trim size. Now I do not have any experience on what font or font size to use, but I do have a resource for you. And I'm going to throw it right into the chat box right now. Let me toss it in there. Joel Friedlander at thebookdesigner.com. He is absolutely my go-to. He is the one, and I'm going to drop that into the, into the chat box right now, thebookdesigner.com. And I will also put it in the Free Advice Friday live page that you guys are watching uh, for um, on Facebook. But Joel Friedlander is absolutely my go-to when I have questions about what font to use or what um, or what trim size. He and his team are a wonderful resource. I adore their their uh, blog, their their resources. So if you go to thebookdesigner.com, he actually has articles that will that will tell you exactly what sort of font you that he would suggest that you use. All right, so let me drop that into. Hey, Robbie, I see you on Facebook Live. Uh, thebookdesigner.com, not book designer, but thebookdesigner.com. Absolutely where I'd go for a font question. Now, uh, Denise, what I know about your novel is that if it were up to me, I would suggest five and a quarter by eight for the trim size. Uh, but because I know you and I know your book, uh, so for those of you who are trying to decide what trim size to use, don't just go to six by nine. Six by nine is not the answer just to knee jerk because that's what Ingram Spark or KDP is suggesting. Six by nine is the easiest uh, book size. It's the default, but it is not always the best. And I actually have a blog about this at newshelves.com slash blog. And I believe the name of the blog is should my, you know, no, your book shouldn't be six by nine. So if you have a novel or a nonfiction book, but any way you look at it, if you have a book, that you are curious about what the trim size is, I update every month the top trim sizes by category at my blog. 
just go to newshelves.com slash blog to check out yours. But for those of you who are writing a YA fantasy novel right now, the, the, the closest I would strongly suggest you try maybe five by eight. Those are available through print on demand. But the way I do it is I go to the USA Today bestseller lists. I go to the Amazon bestseller list, the New York Times bestseller list every month or two. And I see what all the best selling books are. I put them in a list and I go look up their trim sizes. And you will find that the books that are selling the fastest and the most may not always be the most recent. You know, for those of you who are still, you know, looking for Eat, Pray, Love, which is a 12 year old book at this point, I think they may not be the best choice. So take a look at what Random House and Harper Collins is putting their books out at this point. Uh, Denise is also asking, she has a book on ACX and how can she go about changing it to a new ISBN so it can be available not just on ACX? Well, Denise, it depends on the contract you sign. If you signed an exclusive agreement, which binds you for seven years to ACX for the audio version of your book, I'm afraid you're stuck. Um, now, you may be able to do another audio version of your next book. I don't believe that ACX binds your publishing house. It just binds your book. But you can't just go, you know, taking that, putting a new ISBN on it and taking their, if, if, especially if they produced it for you. You signed an agreement with them. I've seen these ACX agreements and I believe that you are in a seven-year contract with them. Now, not all ACX agreements are that restrictive. You may have chosen a contract that doesn't give them exclusivity for seven years, that doesn't do those. So, so it depends on your contract. So if you'd like to, to, to take a look at your contract and see what you've agreed to, and if it turns out that you didn't sign an exclusivity, then yes, all you need to do is take your your files and take them to, uh, you know, get a new ISBN and take them to another distributor like Find Away Voices and the like. But for the most part, ACX does require an exclusive signature. And so you may have done that already. All right, Sue, let's see. Did you ask your question on the Q&A? If not, or I see Sandy is asking in the chat box if 190,000 words is too big for, for a first novel. Wow, Sandy, 190,000 words. Okay, it's your first novel. And so my question back to you is, did you have it development edited by a professional editor who works with, with novelists at some of the larger houses? Are you working with an editor who really knows their stuff? Because at 190,000 words, that to me does not feel like, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like, you worked with an editor or that if you worked with an editor, you worked with an editor who knows how to, to produce a manuscript that is ready for publication. 200,000 words is an enormous book. And yes, I know Diana Gabaldon did it with Outlander, but she did it with the help of an entire resource team by a top publisher. Yes, 190,000 words at first blush seems way too long of a book. That feels like three books, to be honest with you. If you're trying to get published by a New York house or any house, if you want to get an agent, uh, they're going to take one look at an almost 200,000 word manuscript and, and you're just going to go right into the no thank you pile. If you are trying to self-publish, may I ask, what does your team look like? So who are you working with on this? Did they go through your 190,000 words and say it's perfect? And, and if so, who are they? So I'm sorry to ask you questions back. Um, Sue and Sandy, and those of you who are in the chat box, I'll look back and forth. Sandy, if you want to keep going in chat, that's fine. I, I will answer. But it seems way too big for a book. Most readers will not slog through that. Uh, now, a lot of readers love a value. They love a $4.99 ebook that takes them 15 hours to read. But if this is your first book, then you probably haven't proven yourself or found your readership yet. If I'm wrong, please, I would love to continue the conversation. Just throw it into the chat box on Zoom. I am looking here. Hey, Robbie, I'm looking here on Facebook Live and I don't see any questions there. So I'm going to head back to my Zoom chat, which is where I host this webinar. Again, amysadvice.com 
is where to go if you'd like to join us live. For those of you who are watching this on Facebook Live, please comment, please hit share. I'd love it if you'd share this video and this every Friday resource at 10 a.m. I'd love it if you'd share it with your friends or in your groups. I love to answer questions for people. Ray is saying that when she bought her own copy of her hardback from Ingram Spark, the visual's off center because of the spine and that it, it was it was shifted. Does she have any recourse? Her designer is good. There's nothing in the system to warn him of this problem. Absolutely, Ray, I face this all the time. Paperback and hardcover, print on demand and digital printers, whether it's KDP or Ingram Spark, they they will tell you, I'm sorry that they didn't warn you, but there there is in their paperwork the acknowledgement that the spine or the front cover, that shifting of printing of a hardcover or a paperback when you print digitally, maybe up to, I believe it's an eighth of an inch off, that it could go off up to an eighth of an inch. The, the give on the side for spine and for front cover is supposed to be a 32nd of an inch on either sides because there will be shifting. If you order your book again, it will probably be shifted to the center. It won't be off, off skew. If it is, then you do need to adjust the file a little bit. But Ingram Spark, KDP, all digital printers will tell you that printing a book digitally is not an exact science, especially for a hardcover where you're doing paper over board or where there's some sort of gluing going on, that there will be a shift of up to an eighth of an inch one way or the other. I'm designing my book right now and my, my co-author, Daniel Hall, wanted, I had a wrap around all the way around the book and he wanted the back cover to stop at the spine and go to all white. And I said to him, okay, we can do that. But with an up to an eighth to an inch give by the digital printers, there's a chance that that orange band from the front cover will smush over a bit to the spine or smush over to the back cover. So the way we solved it is we made the, the orange band go all the way to the spine and stop at the back cover. Because the truth is, if it smushes a little over on the back cover, that's less onerous than if something should happen to the front cover. But there will be a shift, guys, in your digital printing. Technology is improving daily. But at the moment, it's not a matter of recourse. Ingram Spark will probably tell you that that is normal for a digital printer. Now, if the visual is off center and if the spine is off center by more than an eighth of an inch, you absolutely have recourse because that's right in their paperwork, that that's what it says. Wendy was saying that she heard from ACX that it may be possible to get out of your contract after one year, but it depends on the contract you sign. Again, guys, I am an English major with a music degree. You do not want to get legal advice from me, but I would recommend you read your contract carefully. I, I also, for those of you who right now, if you are asking if signing up with any aspect of Amazon, be it ACX or Kindle, if any aspect, if they want exclusivity, if they want, if they want to put you in Kindle Select or the ACX exclusive and you think, well, that's a great idea. I want to sign up for exclusivity. Be aware of what you're giving away. Yes, you get some things. Yes, it is easier to get an audiobook at less expensive and upload more quickly if you decide to give them a seven year exclusive. But what are you losing? What are you exchanging? For Kindle Select, you do get the opportunity to do some free book giveaways and you get a, a lot more lift with the Kindle Direct, the Kindle Unlimited reads and those things. But for 90 days, you're not allowed to put your ebook anywhere else, anywhere else. Is it worth it? Do you really want to give up the freedom and the autonomy that comes with being able to distribute your book anywhere for the little that you get in return from Amazon? For me, the answer is no. It may not be the same answer for you, but I ask you to really think about whether or not you want to give up the autonomy and the freedom of distributing everywhere. Just my two cents. All right. All right, so Sue is asking, well, let's go back to Sue's question. Thank you, Sue, for uh, uh, coming back to the q and I appreciate it. She has a two-part question. She has a, a comprehensive, her main book printed, pr published by a hybrid publisher, which has been out for seven years, but still is in the top 10 in her category on Amazon several times a year. That's wonderful. Sue, it has made you quite a bit of money. I'm thrilled to hear that. Um, but she's now self-publishing a three-book series based in part on that first main book and would like to upsell the main book. 
However, she's tired of getting of them getting 90%. So she's talked to them about buying her book back and she can for a reasonable price. Do I recommend buying one's own book so you can have all the files? Oh yes, I do know this answer. She knows she can get it up on Amazon, but what about Ingram Spark? Here's what I do. If you have been published by a hybrid publisher, a co-publisher, a vanity press, whatever you wanna call it, not all of them are the same. Some of them are great, some are not. But if you have been published in the past and you are ready to take the book on yourself and publish it under your own imprint, this is the things that I would recommend you do. To start, I would recommend that you ask them how much it would cost to get the source files, the non-flattened InDesign source files from the publisher. You don't just want the PDFs. How much would it cost to get the non-flattened, the layered InDesign files from your publishing house? And then for the most part, whatever they want, go ahead and pay for it. Now, if they want three grand, don't. But for a couple hundred bucks, absolutely worth it because then you can take those files to your own designer. Second step, you go to Bowker, you buy your own ISBNs, buy a batch of 10 or, or 100, you know, maybe buy 100, but buy a batch of ISBNs and make the changes or hire a designer to make the changes to your file where you take off your first publisher's logo and any reference to their name. You make any corrections you want to fix that punctuation error on page 32 that's been driving you nuts. Change the copyright page come out with a second edition under your new ISBN and your publishing house. There will be a new pub date. There, this is a new edition and the pub date will then now be refreshed. The copyright pages, the, the copyright date is the same. Unless you're making dramatic, at least 20% revisions. If at least 20% of the book is being updated or revised, then you can say it's an updated and revised second edition, in which case the copyright, everything changes. But if you're just coming out with a new edition under a new publishing house, the copyright date stays the same, but the pub date becomes, I don't know, October 2019 or whenever your pub date is. So first step, get the files. Second step, adjust the files. Third step, upload it under your account at Ingram Spark. If you're going to do a, which I always recommend, a combo of KDP for Amazon and Ingram Spark for the rest of the industry, Put the book up on KDP first. Make sure that it all works out there. KDP gets a little sticky and they're getting a little touchy about uh, accepting ISBNs that are already up on Ingram Spark. So do KDP first, get that good and clean, then put it up on Ingram Spark. So I don't blame you. You've, you know, the, it's a great book, it's gotten a lot of lift. But at this point, if you're doing all the work to promote it, if you're doing all the heavy lifting, then at seven years, it is definitely time for a new edition. Freshen it up, freshen the cover up, get um, some new information in that comprehensive main book, put out a second edition. If you have the time, put out a second updated edition. I mean, really, you know, get it out there. And yes, you can get it up on Amazon through KDP. And yes, you can get it up on Ingram Spark to get it into the rest of the world. Absolutely in that order. Again, for those of you who are interested in these steps, I write a number of blogs about this, including why you need KDP and Ingram Spark side by side. And that is at newshelves.com slash blog, newshelves.com slash blog. For those of you who are watching me live on Facebook, please go ahead and hit the share or ask your questions down in the comment box. I'm looking at those at the moment. I only see uh, two comments. I don't see any questions on Facebook, but I see a lot of you watching and I wanna say, hey. So please, if you're finding this advice helpful, hit the share button, let people know that they can join me here every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, I answer questions for as long as you guys can stand me. And uh, it's great seeing you all. Amy'sAdvice.com is where to go to sign up to participate live. Uh, Ray is uh, who was asking about her her shifted cover. You should absolutely buy another copy. Um, but Ray, being that you're in Germany, um, I would have you buy a copy and maybe a friend of yours. I mean, I'll do it, but a friend of yours because I mean, I know you. But somebody in the U.S. should also buy a copy and see maybe it's the printers over in Germany that are a problem or the printers in the U.S. Um, Sue, now back to Sue's question, because she does have a two-part question. She wants to know what else she needs to do when she publishes the second book. Okay, 
to I have a video I want you to watch. I want you to go to bestsellervideo.com. There is at that point, there will be a 45, it's almost an hour long video. It's totally free that I've put together for people that gives them a list of ideas of what they need to do to properly launch a book and a publishing platform for an author. I would love to answer that question about what else you need to do to launch your book, but it's a little like asking, how do I build a roller coaster out of wood and metal? It's a big question. And I need more time than I have on Free Advice Friday, but I would love to be of help. And I have a number of resources, my book, The Right Way, which you can get for free on my website. I have a, You can download the ebook for free at uh, newshelves.com slash store. Just go and let, you can buy the paperback, but you can also download the ebook for free. I actually outline in 160 or so pages exactly how to publish a book and all the steps you need to take. The video, if you prefer to watch a video, takes about 45 minutes to an hour to watch, and it's at bestsellervideo.com. So going to those places, they will give you a very comprehensive list of what you need to do if you're going to publish your own book. Annette is asking, what do you do if you want to find out the names of bookstores that have ordered your book on Ingram Spark? The reports only show the number of books that have been ordered and which country. It doesn't tell you if it was a library or another wholesaler or the bookstore or the retailer. And that is true. If you would like to know where Amazon, excuse me, where Ingram is selling your book, I'm afraid the answer is you can't. And it's not just you. You're not being penalized. Ingram will not share that information with any publisher, no matter how big or small you are. That is a private interaction between them and their customers, and their customers would not be happy if they found out that they were sending out their name and contact information or even their, their, um, their general information to publishers. That is a private interaction between Ingram and their customers, and they're not going to share with you the name of the stores. One of the biggest problems that people have when they sell through Amazon or when they sell through Ingram is they want to know who is buying their books. And so the way that you go about that is a little bit, it's, it's around the back a bit. What you can do is you can create a social media campaign or an email campaign where you encourage people who have bought your book to share it with you on social media or an email and give them something in exchange. I have an author that I'm working with right now. Jeannie Felt is coming out with a wonderful book called Bridge to Us. And her book Bridge to Us actually comes out in a few weeks. But before it's it's in it's in pre-order right now for the the ebook the the paperback just came out in the last week or two, but as she's building up to her ebook release and her print book release, she is coming up with different ways to get people to share her book. So if and what she's doing is she's creating a program where if people take a picture of themselves with her book and post it on social media and tag her or hashtag a certain hashtag she's come up with, she will then give them something in exchange. Um, I believe it's a signed, I believe it's a signed print copy. So a screenshot of them ordering the, the ebook or there's a number of things that, that she's coming up with this program. I would suggest you do something very similar. There is no way to find out the bookstores that are ordering your book, but there is a way to find out what libraries are stocking your book. And the way to find out if a library is stocking your book is simply to go to worldcat.org. Here, I'm gonna jot that right into the chat box right now. Let's see, all panelists and attendees, worldcat.org. Worldcat.org is a website that if you click on it and you put your ISBN or your author name or your book name in and you find your book, and then you click on all versions or all editions of the book, you will see a list of all the libraries listed in WorldCat that are stocking your book right now, either as an ebook, an audiobook, or a print book. It's wonderful. And I noticed that in the chat box, I um, thebookdesigner.com only went to panelists. So I asked, in essence, I chatted myself. So I'm dropping that in the in the box now. Let's see if there's any more comments on Facebook. Again, for those of you who want to join us live and get your questions answered in the Zoom webinar itself, just go to amysadvice.com. Stephen is asking, how much lead time do you recommend for contacting libraries to do an event at the library or to submit a book? That's two different questions, Stephen, and this is, this is how I'd answer it. If you wanna do an event, 90 days. 
I would say 90 days is fair. Tell them that you, you know, it's if it's August now, tell them that you've got events that you're trying to book for November and December. Now, the same is true for bookstores, but be aware, libraries and bookstores, they like 90 days before they even start considering events. But most bookstores are not going to do an event in November, December. They're a little busy with the holiday craziness. Libraries may or may not. You need It depends on the library. But I would say 90 days at the outside. I have booked as as recent as 45. But anything after 45 days, it's just silly because you've got to book it. You've got to get the details worked out. You have to promote it. It has to get into their newsletter. A lot of libraries close their newsletter quarterly. So I would say 90 days is a very fair, 60 maybe, but shoot for 90. Now, if you're just presenting your book to them, there is no lead time. Every library buys differently. Some libraries buy once a year, some buy once a week, some buy once a month, some buy by committee. Some one librarian decides for three different branches and another library system, every librarian decides on their own. Some have budgets that come due every quarter. It's different. So there is no hard and fast rule for when to submit a book for purchase. Just start sending it out and understand that if somebody likes your book, in the library system, they may schedule you for purchase, but you may not see that purchase for months. That doesn't mean they didn't like your book. It doesn't mean your book isn't awesome and that libraries aren't gonna be a huge success. Don't get discouraged if you don't see a big boost when you first start selling to libraries. In many, many cases, they have to wait until they've got some money. All right, uh, Stephen is asking about building a platform to marketing to increase exposure. Again, Stephen, there is a video up. It is bestsellervideo.com. If you go to bestsellervideo.com, there is a 45 minute, maybe an hour long class that gives you nine very executable ideas about how to build a platform. I talk about booking yourself on the radio and podcasts. I talk about how to find your readers and connect with them online in a way that you're being friendly and of service and not being all pushy and salesy. I talk about video. I talk about writing for newspapers and magazines and blogs. I talk about reviews. All of these things are important. And I would recommend that, that anyone who goes to bestsellervideo.com take a few minutes and watch that list. Stephen is asking if there's any set it and forget it systems or resources that you'd recommend, at least things you could do once and not worry about them for several months to help with marketing. Let me think about that. What do I put, put in place? You know what? There are a few things that you can do that will dramatically increase that you can do every few months. Here's a couple of ideas. If you are looking for a few quick fixes that you don't need to do every week or touch again for a while, here are some of my ideas. I want you to go into all your social media accounts, including your author central account on Amazon, your, um, if you've got a Kobo or a Nook account and you, I want you to go in everywhere where your books are listed or where you are listed as an author. And I want you to take a look at your bio. Does your bio have updated links? Is there a call to action? Do you ask them to go to a site? Do you ask them to actually buy your book or download a freebie in exchange for an email? Getting your bio and your information wired up every three months is a fantastic way to increase your SEO and increase the results of your sales and to be able to build your email list. Too many authors, me included, get busy with other things. I go running off to, to speak in public or I'm doing webinars or podcasts and I forget to check my bio, my book descriptions. I would recommend that if you're looking for a quick way to make a big difference, go to Amazon and tweak your book descriptions right now. Go to Kindlepreneur if you, if you want to. KDP Rocket is a term, a search uh, tool they have. Get some great keywords. Tighten up your book descriptions. Tighten up your biography. That is set it and forget it. If you spend a little bit of time doing that, you can then go away for the next three, four months and rest assured that you're in good shape. But set a note on your calendar to go back in December and do it again. Um, do it a couple times a year. I recommend that that it has made a big difference for me and some of my authors just to touch and to to constant. It's this. It's no different than straightening up your living room. It doesn't look bad to you, but that's because you live in it. You want to make sure that your book description, your bios, everything you do 
that it is in a, in a, in a perfect condition for the reader. Maybe you don't be the one who decides if it's in good shape. Give some of your readers a chance to evaluate it for you. Another tool that I absolutely love and that I recently learned from Vicki Fitch, a, a book consultant, excuse me, a business consultant I'm working with, is she told me about a piece of software called Recur Post. R-E-C-U-R-P-O-S-T, Recur Post. And Recur Post is a tool. I was using Hootsuite, but I really like Recur Post because what happens is I have a year's worth of content that I have been posting on Hootsuite. But once I post it, I post it. Recur Post is a tool that takes your blogs, the articles you share, the memes you create, the visuals you create, the things that you share. And if you put them through Recur Post, it will schedule them to post again a few weeks or a few months down the line. You can decide which ones you want to post again, but how amazing would it be if you've got a particularly great review or a wonderful article about you and your book and you post it once or twice and then you're done. But what if it just automatically posted again three weeks from now and it caught a bunch of people who didn't see it the first time? But you don't have to think about it. It does it automatically. So if you're looking for set it and forget it, I have been very impressed the last few weeks with Recur Post. All right. Um, Sue is saying that the buyback for her files involves buying a number of her own books for a total cost of $2,000. Oh, Sue. All right. Oh, that's not good. Um, you could simply take your manuscript and get it designed and laid out for far less than that. Um, just cancel your contract for heaven's sakes. You don't need to buy back the book. I, I don't know your contract, but if it's one of these places that insists that you, you know, buy a certain number of books in exchange, um, I'm sure there's an out clause. And if there's not, guys, for those of you who are signing with hybrid publishers, co-publishers, make sure that you have an out clause. Um, but for $2,000, I mean, unless your book is 800 pages, you can get the whole thing redone for less than that nowadays. If you do, Sue's asking if you do the second edition, do you need to buy back the original? I don't know. Sue, I don't know what your contract says. I don't know if you've given them the publishing rights and that they have the right to, to hold them or if you have an out. I'm so sorry. Linda's asking about finding keywords. Do I use Google Keywords Planner or another one? I use KDP Rocket. I use, um, I use Hashtagify Me. Hashtagify me is a great way to find keywords and to find hashtags. KDP Rocket is a great place to find keywords. I use TwinWords. Now, TwinWords is powered by Google. So in essence, it's the same thing as Google Keyword Planner, but TwinWords.com is much easier to use. Um, I actually pay for the, the pro edition every year, but TwinWords, the nice thing is they do have a free edition that gives you up to 250 keywords per search. So twinwords.com, KDP Rocket, fantastic tool. Just Google it. Kindlepreneur is where you find KDP Rocket. And for those of you who are looking to really maximize your hashtags, I use hashtagify me. All right. Let's see what we've got here. I can't believe it's after 1030 already. You guys are, well, Wendy is reminding me that KDP Rocket is now called KDP Publisher. You're right. Wendy, thank you. You're always so on top of things for me, and I appreciate it. I wish you were here. Um, it's every week. You are so helpful. Uh, guys, KDP Rocket has been renamed. Wendy's right. It's um, called KDP Publisher, so that's fantastic. Uh, Stephen, I got to tell you, Ellie's loving your questions. Keep them coming. You're, you've got a big fan over here. Uh, so let's see what Ellie is asking. She, um, she goes to an open mic uh, and reads from her book. Is there any norm of how long she has to read in an open mic event? And then she says, I love Stephen's questions, by the way. It depends on the open mic. Now, if this is an open mic, if this is a poetry and a literary open mic, they have a time limit posted. Everyone I've ever been to says, you have three minutes, you have five minutes. They will tell you the time limit. If it is an open mic that has music and has poetry and has readings, what they usually, they're usually a little more flexible. I would recommend at this point, if it's your first one, less is more, less is more. I would definitely read for three minutes at the most. Get them to want you to come back the next week. 
um, you know, three minutes, maybe four, no more than four. I'm saying three. Time yourself. See what three minutes feels like. It will actually feel like a very long time to you and perhaps to your audience um, if you go much longer than that. So that is my, my advice. Maybe you want to read two excerpts from your book and keep it to two minutes each. That's great, but tell people at the open mic what you're gonna do. I'm going to read one excerpt. It's going to take about three minutes. I'm going to read two excerpts. They're each about two, two and a half minutes. Tell them what you're gonna do so that the audience doesn't sit there. What you don't want is a member of an open mic or of, and I do this on readings too, when I do this at events. If someone's sitting there and after five minutes is saying, how long is this woman gonna read? She's no longer listening to me. They're not listening to me. They're thinking about how long is this, you know, how long do I have to act interested, you know? So do yourself a favor, do them a favor. Tell them what you're going to read and how long roughly it's going to take at the beginning. And then everyone's going to relax. They're going to be grateful. It's a little tip that I have found very, very helpful whenever you do live readings. All right. Um, uh, Ray's wanting to know how to see your, your client's social media campaign. Well, for those of you who are interested in Jeannie Felt, just go to Facebook or, or go on to Instagram or Twitter and look up Jeannie Felt, J-E-A-N-N-E, F-E-L-F-E, Felt, F-E-L-F-E. Just friend her on Facebook, uh, follow her on Twitter. You'll get to see all the stuff she's doing. Annette is asking, will librarians purchase older novels, especially ones that were published, let's say five years ago or earlier, or are they more interested in current titles? And do they purchase based on genre more than pub date? No, it's both. If you have an older book, especially a book that is older than two years old, in the first two years, you're fine. But library wholesalers, places like Brodart and even Baker and Taylor have said out loud that they don't even really consider books that are less than, more than two years old. So if you have a book that is more than two years old, the wholesalers such as Brodart and Baker and Taylor probably won't list you. And that's going to make it harder for you to get into the libraries. Now, if you're in Ingram because of Ingram Spark or what used to be Lightning Source, then libraries may order your book, but a library has a lot of books coming at them, new books. If you've written a novel that takes place in the, the wilds of Africa, why would they buy your five-year-old book that has older reviews that people may or may not still be hearing about when instead they can buy a book, a romance novel that takes place in the wilds of Africa that's coming out this month. They know that books that come out this month are advertised, that they're being promoted, that the authors are excited and they're sharing it on social media. They're getting the word out. Librarians want to stock books that their patrons are going to come in and ask for. And a five-year-old book usually doesn't have the marketing lift behind it that a new book does. And that if your book is the exception, if your five-year-old, six-year-old book still has a huge amount of marketing lift and activity behind it, then go to the libraries. Simply tell them that and you will probably start getting some orders. But for the most part, if you have an older book, it's not going to get the benefit of the doubt that a new book would. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you it was different. All right. Linda and some other people, they're asking, how do you find out about open mics and literary readings? Here's a couple places I go. Of course, start with Google and, yeah, and simply say open mic and then a plus sign in the name of your city. That's one way to go. Literary readings, um, poetry slams, and then go to the websites. But another place, meetup.com. Go to events.com meetup.com, google.com, you will be able to find a lot of literary and open mics and readings. If like here in Rochester, there's an organization called Writers and Books. They host readings all the time. There are coffee houses. May I suggest that you hop onto the websites of all of the local coffee houses in your town and see if they're hosting any open mics. Those are five ways that you can find open mics. I hope that helps. Uh, Ray is asking. I'm happy to. Ray, I am typing in Jeannie's name right now. She would, uh, uh, Ray wants to know if there's any such thing as a nonfiction reading. Yeah, um, I do them all the time. We call them workshops. <laughs> we don't call them readings, but you could go to any store or any organization you want 
And if you've written a book, a nonfiction book on a particular topic, like mine is on how to become a best-selling author. My upcoming book, The Best-Selling Author that Daniel Hall and John Rhodes and I are putting out together, it's all these executionable marketing ideas about how you can actually grow your platform. I will not do a reading from that book. I won't call it a reading, but I'm going to get a hold of bookstores and libraries and organizations like writers and books and coffee houses, and I'm going to do workshops. And I'm going to send out ads and social media posts where I tell people that I am going to be teaching based on the book, the best-selling author, different executable tips, tricks, and hacks that people can use to grow their platform as an author. And then I'm going to advertise it like crazy. It's not technically a reading. I call it a workshop, but it absolutely works. All right, let's see what else we've got uh, going. Uh, let's see. Oh, Robbie is saying that Meet Edgar is a fantastic, a fantastic tool, and I would like to recommend that. Uh, thank you, Robbie. I'm, I should have kept a closer eye on Facebook Live. Meet Edgar um, is a terrific place to, uh, uh, and if you guys are looking for ideas and how to get going. All right. Uh, Robbie, I'm so thrilled you're on Facebook Live joining us. If you have any questions, um, it is getting close to the end of this week's Free Advice Friday. We do this for about 45 minutes every day. I want to remind those of you who are watching this either on a replay on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Amy Collins, or on Facebook Live, which is at facebook.com slash New Shelves Books, or if you're watching it right here at amysadvice.com, that you can sign up to join me and to get your questions answered live simply by actually signing up for the totally free webinar. It, it costs you nothing. Grace is asking, does it make sense to revise her first book with the original publisher? She self-published with, and then she mentioned a, a, a lovely, very well-respected vanity press that's owned by Author Solutions. And she's writing a second book, but wants to revise the first one before publishing the second one. She's not gonna self-publish again with this particular house, but a friend suggested Lightning Source for the second book. Um, Grace, I would give you the same advice that I'm giving everyone else. Um, I recommend that you take your first, all of your books back from the self-publishing vanity houses. Now, I don't mean all, all not all self-company, uh, self-publishing, not all co-publishing companies or hybrid publishers are vanity houses. They're not. But if you find that you have fallen in with an actual vanity press, you can actually publish your book yourself and get all the same results for far less money and far more profits by doing it on your own. But here's the big question, folks. Do you have the time, the energy, the focus, and the money to publish your book on your own? Because what you're doing is you are learning how to start a small business. So Grace is saying that she's going to publish her second book using the print on demand world of Ingram Spark, which used to be called, and in some cases is called, called Lightning Source. You'll be using KDP publishing and all of those aspects. But do you have the time, the energy and the bandwidth to learn how to do it? Do you want to learn about the Library of Congress and about ISBNs and proper cover design? Do you want to find the designers? Do you have everything in place or are you willing to put things in place? If not, I have a third option for you. You might want to consider hiring a publishing expert or a publishing. There's book shepherds out there. I, I'm not one of them, but I do know a lot of good ones that can actually teach you how to publish your book yourself. There are companies out there and there's women out there like Alexa Bigwarf from Kit, uh, Cat Biggie Press. Um, and she's got a company called Write, Publish, Sell. There's the Independent Book Publishers Association, ibpa-online.org. They have great, take the time to educate yourself and to really learn what you're getting into. Because if you don't have the time, the bandwidth, or the energy to learn an entire new industry, you might want to hire someone to do it for you. And we do do that here. So you can get a hold of me at Bestseller Builders, and we'd be happy to do that for you. I want you guys to own your own ISBNs, your publishing rights. I don't want you giving anyone even one penny of your sales because they published your book for you. You guys can do this yourself, or you can hire someone like me to do it for you, where you actually then own the book, the publishing house, and everything on your own. There are ways to go about this where you don't have to give up exclusivity or your rights. All right. Uh, bum, bum, bum. 
I accidentally, Linda's telling me that I accidentally said that I do these live videos every day. Thank you guys. Between Wendy and Linda and the rest of you and, and Ellie, I mean, my God, you guys have totally got my back today and I appreciate it. Um, we do these every Friday at 10 a.m. Every Friday at 10 a.m. It's Free Advice Friday. Please, if you're watching this live on my YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button below, share it. If you're watching it on Facebook, either as a replay or live, please be sure to share it with your folks. I would love to answer your questions next Friday at 10 a.m. We are here every Friday at 10 a.m. I give preference to those who have actually signed up for the webinar. I believe I've asked, I've answered everyone's questions. Let me make sure. Um, uh, again, Sue, Wendy, Annette, thank, Stephen, thank you for your questions. People are absolutely loving your questions. I love it. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I got them all. It was wonderful seeing you this week. I will see you guys next week on Free Advice Friday, 10 a.m. Go to amysadvice.com and we will see you next week at Bestseller Builders and at Free Advice Friday. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.